My name is Sarah, and I've always believed that family is the most precious thing in life. I'm married to my loving husband, Jack, and we have two wonderful adult children, our son, Michael, and our daughter, Emily. Michael followed in his father's footsteps and became an engineer, while Emily pursued her passion for art. I couldn't have been prouder of both of them. Emily's artistic career took off quickly after college. She organized exhibitions that drew quite a crowd, and I never missed a single one. I remember her first major show like it was yesterday. The gallery was packed, and Emily's paintings were the talk of the evening. As I walked around the gallery admiring Emily's work, I spotted her talking animatedly with a tall, handsome man. Little did I know then that this man, David, would become her husband and the father of my granddaughter. Their whirlwind romance was a joy to watch. David seemed to adore Emily, and she was happier than I'd ever seen her. They married in a beautiful ceremony just a year after they met, and soon after, Emily announced she was pregnant. I was over the moon at the prospect of becoming a grandmother. When little Sophia was born, I fell in love all over again. She had Emily's dark curls and David's green eyes, a perfect combination of both her parents. It was around this time that Emily made a decision that surprised me. She announced that she was quitting her job to work from home and raise Sophia full-time. Are you sure about this, honey? I asked her one afternoon as we sat in her living room, watching Sophia play with her blocks. Your career was just taking off. I'd be more than happy to help with Sophia if you want to keep working." Emily shook her head, a determined look in her eyes. I appreciate the offer, Mom, but I want to do this myself. I'm ready to sacrifice my career for Sophia. She needs me right now. I couldn't quite shake the feeling that something was off about this decision, but I respected Emily's choice. After all, she was a grown woman capable of making her own decisions. As the months passed, I noticed that Emily became more distant. Our regular coffee dates became less frequent, and when I called, she always seemed to be busy. As Emily drifted away, I found myself spending more time with Michael and his wife, Lisa. When they had their son, Tommy, Lisa asked if I could help out as a nanny. Of course, I jumped at the chance. And so, I threw myself into my role as Tommy's nanny. It was exhausting but rewarding work, and it helped fill the void left by Emily's absence. Still, I couldn't help but wonder if Emily was upset about the time I was spending with Tommy. I wanted to talk to her about it, but she kept avoiding my calls and cancelling our plans. As Christmas approached, I held on to hope that Emily would reach out. I imagined us all gathered around the tree, Sophia opening presents with wide-eyed wonder. But as the days ticked by, that hope began to fade. On Christmas Eve, I sent Emily a message. Merry Christmas, sweetheart. We miss you and would love to see you tomorrow. Love, Mom. Hours passed, with no response. I tried to focus on the joy of having Michael, Lisa, and Tommy over, but Emily's absence cast a shadow over the festivities. Christmas morning came and still no word from Emily. As we sat around opening presents, I couldn't help but notice the empty spot where Emily, David, and Sophia should have been. Mom, are you okay? Michael asked, noticing my distraction. I forced a smile. Of course, dear. Just thinking about how fast you've all grown up. But inside, I was seething. This wasn't just about missing a family gathering anymore. This was about crossing a line. After the presents were opened and the dinner was cleared away, I turned to Jack. We need to go see Emily, I said firmly. This has gone on long enough. Jack knew better than to argue when I used that tone. He nodded, and we began gathering gifts for Emily, David, and Sophia. As we pulled up to their house, I noticed that the curtains were drawn, and the Christmas lights that Emily usually put up were noticeably absent. My heart sank a little more. We approached the front door, arms laden with gifts. Jack rang the doorbell, and we waited. Seconds stretched into what felt like hours before we heard movement inside. The door creaked open, and there stood Emily. My heart nearly stopped at the sight of her. She looked, different. Tired, yes, but there was something more. 
Her eyes, usually bright and full of life, seemed dull and weary. She was wearing long sleeves, despite the warmth of the house, and she held herself as if she was in pain. Mom? Dad? What are you doing here? Her voice was barely above a whisper. Merry Christmas, sweetheart, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. We missed you at the family gathering, so we thought we'd bring Christmas to you. Emily's eyes darted nervously behind her before she stepped onto the porch, partially closing the door behind her. That's, that's really nice of you, but you shouldn't have come. I'm not feeling well, and I didn't want to get anyone sick. It was then that I noticed the bruise on her arm, partially hidden by her sleeve. My motherly instincts went into overdrive. Emily, what happened to your arm? I asked, reaching out to her. She flinched away from my touch, pulling her sleeve down. Oh, it's nothing. I had a little accident the other day. Slipped in the bathroom. Clumsy me. I exchanged a glance with Jack. We both knew she was lying. Where's Sophia? Jack asked, trying to peek inside the house. We brought her some presents. Emily's face softened at the mention of her daughter. She's napping right now. But I'm sure she'd love to see you. Maybe, maybe she could come visit you tomorrow? I nodded eagerly, grasping at this olive branch. Of course. We'd love to have her over. We chatted for a few more minutes, the conversation stilted and uncomfortable. Emily kept glancing back at the house, as if afraid someone would overhear. As we were about to leave, I couldn't help but pull Emily into a hug. She stiffened at first, but then melted into my embrace. For a moment, I felt like I was holding my little girl again. The next day, I woke up early, my mind still reeling from our visit to Emily's house. I busied myself in the kitchen, preparing Sophia's favorite foods and setting up some art supplies. Around noon, the doorbell rang. I rushed to answer it, finding Emily standing there with Sophia. My heart ached at the sight of my daughter, her eyes darting nervously as if expecting trouble. Hi, Mom, she said softly. Sophia's excited to spend some time with you. I knelt down to Sophia's level, opening my arms. Hello, sweetheart. Grandma's so happy to see you. Sophia hesitated for a moment before running into my embrace. I held her tightly, breathing in her sweet, familiar scent. Emily handed me Sophia's backpack. I packed some of her things. I'll be back to pick her up this evening, okay? I turned my attention to my granddaughter, determined to make the most of our time together. Come on, sweetie. Let's go see what fun things grandma has planned. We spent the afternoon drawing, baking cookies, and playing with dolls. It was wonderful to see Sophia laugh and play, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. She seemed more subdued than usual, often glancing at the door as if expecting someone to burst in. As we sat coloring together, I decided to gently probe. Sophia, honey, is everything okay at home? Sophia's crayon paused mid-stroke. She looked up at me with those big, innocent eyes. Mommy cries a lot, she said quietly. My heart clenched. Why does mommy cry, sweetheart? Sophia shrugged, returning to her coloring. Daddy yells at her. He says mean things. I tried to keep my voice calm, even as anger and fear surged through me. What kind of mean things, Sophia? He says mommy is stupid and can't do anything right. Sometimes he grabs her arms really hard. Sophia demonstrated, gripping her own arm tightly. We sat like that for a while, my mind racing. I knew I had to do something but I wasn't sure what. I couldn't let Emily and Sophia continue living in fear. As the afternoon wore on, Sophia's play took a disturbing turn. She began acting out scenes with her dolls, making them yell at each other and push each other around. Sophia, I said gently, where did you learn to play like that? She looked up at me, her face serious. That's how daddy treats mommy sometimes. After Sophia's revelations, I couldn't sit idle any longer. I called Lisa, my daughter-in-law, and asked if she could watch Sophia for a few hours. She agreed without hesitation, sensing the urgency in my voice. Jack, 
I said, my voice trembling with a mix of fear and determination. We need to go to Emily's house. Now. He nodded, his face grim. I'll drive. The ride to Emily's house was tense, filled with unspoken worries. As we pulled up to their street, I suggested we speak to the neighbors first. Maybe they've heard something, I reasoned. It could give us a better idea of what's really going on. We approached the house next door, and a middle-aged woman answered. Her eyes narrowed as we introduced ourselves as Emily's parents. We're concerned about our daughter, I explained. Have you heard any disturbances from their house? Any arguments or screaming? The woman's face hardened. I haven't heard a thing, she said dismissively. They seem like a perfectly normal couple to me. Her arrogant tone set my teeth on edge, but I thanked her politely. As we walked away, Jack squeezed my hand reassuringly. We were about to knock on Emily's door when we heard it, David's voice, raised in anger. Why did you let Sophia go to your mother's? You know, I don't like her spending time there. My blood ran cold. Jack and I exchanged a look of horror, before I jabbed the doorbell, my heart pounding. The shouting abruptly stopped. Moments later, David opened the door, a pleasant smile plastered on his face. Sarah, Jack, what a surprise! What brings you here? He asked, his voice eerily calm. I peered past him, my eyes widening as I saw Emily struggling to her feet. Without a word, I pushed past David and rushed to my daughter's side. Emily, sweetheart, are you all right? I asked, checking her for visible injuries. She nodded weakly, avoiding my gaze. Anger surged through me as I turned to face David. How dare you treat my daughter like this? I hissed, my voice low and dangerous. I know what's been going on here, and I won't stand for it any longer. David's facade cracked for a moment before he regained his composure. I think you've misunderstood, Sarah. I'm simply trying to raise my wife properly. She can be quite difficult sometimes, you know. Raise her? I spat. She's your wife, not your child. And there's nothing proper about abuse. David's eyes narrowed. Why don't we ask the neighbors? They'll tell you everything's fine here. In that moment, I realized the horrifying truth, the neighbors were complicit in this abuse, turning a blind eye to Emily's suffering. I think it's time for you to leave, David said coldly. I need some time to cool down. We can discuss this, misunderstanding later. Before I could protest, he was out the door, leaving us alone with Emily. As soon as he was gone, Emily broke down. Through her tears, she began to reveal the full extent of her ordeal. David had forced her to quit her job, isolated her from family and friends. He controlled her every move, checking her phone and taking away her car. He told the neighbors I was a bad wife and mother, she whispered. That he was raising me to be better. They all believed him. I became an outcast in my own neighborhood. My heart shattered as I listened to my daughter's pain. I held her tightly, vowing silently that I would do whatever it took to get her and Sophia out of this nightmare. He's gone to get more alcohol, Emily said, fear creeping into her voice. He'll be back soon. As we began to plan our next move, I knew we were in for a fight. But looking at my daughter's bruised but hopeful face, I knew it was a fight worth having. No matter what it took, we would free Emily from this cycle of abuse and bring her home where she belonged. I turned to Emily, my voice firm, but gentle. Sweetheart, I want you to pack your things and Sophia's. You're coming home with us. Emily's eyes widened with a mix of hope and fear. But mom, what about David? He'll be so angry. Jack stepped forward, his jaw set with determination. That's his problem, not yours. I'm your father, and I'll protect you. Both of you." With trembling hands, Emily began to gather their belongings. I helped her, moving quickly and efficiently, knowing time was of the essence. Within minutes, we had packed the essentials into two suitcases. As we left the house, I could hear murmuring voices. A group of neighbors had gathered near the gate, their eyes following us with disapproval. An elderly woman stepped forward, her face pinched with judgment. You should be ashamed, she spat at me. 
you've raised your daughter poorly. She should be grateful that her husband tolerates her and takes care of her and the child. Anger surged through me. Without a word, I gently took Emily's arm and pushed up her sleeve, revealing the dark bruises that mottled her skin. Is this what you call taking care? I asked, my voice ringing out in the sudden silence. Would any of you like to be raised like this? The neighbors' faces flushed with embarrassment, and they quickly dispersed, avoiding eye contact. We hurried to the car, Jack helping Emily with the suitcases, while I kept watch. Just as we were about to leave, I spotted a familiar figure running towards us. David, I gasped. He was red-faced with rage as he reached the car, immediately grabbing for Emily. What do you think you're doing, he snarled. Before I could react, Jack was there, pushing David away from the car door. Don't you dare touch her, he growled. Stay away from my daughter. David's eyes darted between us, his fists clenching and unclenching at his sides. The situation was escalating quickly. We need to call the police, I said, pulling out my phone with shaking hands. As I dialed, Jack ushered Emily into the car. We quickly locked the doors, our hearts pounding as David circled the vehicle like a predator. You can't take her, he shouted, kicking the car in frustration. She's my wife. I spoke calmly to the 911 operator, explaining the situation while keeping an eye on David's increasingly erratic behavior. Emily sat in the back seat, her face pale with fear. It's okay, sweetheart, I reassured her. The police are on their way. We're going to be fine. Minutes felt like hours as we waited, David's shouts growing more desperate. I could see neighbors peeking out of windows, witnessing the scene but doing nothing to intervene. Finally, we heard sirens in the distance. David's face contorted with panic, and for a moment, I thought he might try to run. But he stood his ground, a defiant look in his eyes as the police cars pulled up. The arrival of the police brought a momentary sense of relief. Officers quickly assessed the situation, examining Emily's visible injuries and taking statements from all parties involved. The tension in the air was palpable as David was handcuffed and placed in the back of a police car. He'll be detained for a few days while we investigate, one of the officers informed us. We'll need you to come to the station to provide a formal statement, Mrs. Thompson. Emily nodded, her voice barely above a whisper. Okay. The next few days were a whirlwind of activity. Emily bravely recounted her experiences to the police, her voice growing stronger with each retelling. I stayed by her side, offering support and corroborating her story where I could. However, our hope for a quick resolution was dashed when David's lawyer presented a united front of neighbors all claiming that Emily and David had a perfectly normal relationship. She's always been dramatic, one neighbor testified. David's a saint for putting up with her. Their words made my blood boil, but I reminded myself to stay calm, for Emily's sake. Determined to prove Emily's innocence, we agreed to a lie detector test. I held my breath as she answered question after question, her voice steady, despite the stress. When the results came back confirming her truthfulness, I felt a surge of vindication. A psychological evaluation followed, revealing the depths of Emily's trauma. Your daughter is suffering from severe depression, likely stemming from prolonged domestic abuse, the psychologist explained to me privately. She'll need ongoing support and therapy. Despite the mounting evidence, David remained adamant about his innocence. His latest threat to seek full custody of Sophia sent Emily into a panic. He can't take her, mom, she sobbed. I can't lose my baby. That's when I knew we needed to dig deeper. I hired a private detective, hoping to uncover something in David's past that would expose his true nature. Weeks passed as the detective worked tirelessly. Emily and Sophia stayed with us, slowly beginning to heal in a safe environment. Watching my daughter rediscover her smile was both heartwarming and heartbreaking. Finally, the detective called with news. Mrs. Thompson, I found something you need to see. The information he presented was shocking. David had a history of domestic violence in another city. He'd been ordered to undergo therapy but had fled the state before completing the program. 
There's more, the detective said grimly. I've collected testimonies from other victims. The pattern is always the same, charm, control, then violence. As I leafed through the files, a mix of emotions washed over me. Anger at David for causing so much pain, relief that we finally had concrete evidence, and sadness for all the women who had suffered before Emily. Thank you, I said to the detective, my voice thick with emotion. This, this changes everything. The day of the court hearing arrived, and the tension in the air was palpable. I sat beside Emily, squeezing her hand reassuringly as we waited for the proceedings to begin. Our lawyer, a stern-faced woman named Ms. Henderson, arranged the stack of evidence before her. As the judge called the court to order, I could see David across the room, looking smug and confident. That confidence, however, began to waver as Ms. Henderson presented our case. Your Honor, she began, I'd like to present evidence of Mr. David Thompson's history of domestic abuse. One by one, she laid out the detective's findings, police reports from David's previous city, incomplete therapy records, and testimonies from past victims. David's lawyer objected vigorously, but the judge overruled him, allowing the evidence. Then came a moment that sent shockwaves through the courtroom. Ms. Henderson called forward a witness, Sarah, David's ex-girlfriend from seven years ago. Sarah's voice trembled as she recounted her experiences. He would fly into rages over the smallest things. The bruises. I had to cover them with makeup every day. Next, Ms. Henderson presented Emily's lie detector results and psychological evaluation. As you can see, Your Honor, Mrs. Emily Thompson's account has been verified by multiple professional sources. The coup de grace came in the form of voice messages David had left on Emily's phone. His threatening voice filled the courtroom. If you ever try to leave me, I'll make sure you never see Sophia again. Just when I thought we'd presented everything, Ms. Henderson surprised us all. Your Honor, we have one more witness. With the court's permission, I'd like to call Sophia Thompson to the stand, accompanied by her child psychologist. My heart clenched as I watched my five-year-old granddaughter walk to the front of the courtroom, her small hand clasped in the psychologist's. Sophia's eyes were wide, but her voice was clear as she spoke. Daddy would yell at mommy a lot, she said. He would push her and say mean things. It scared me. Then came the moment that left the entire courtroom in stunned silence. Sophia's psychologist presented a video to the court, a shaky, dimly lit clip that Sophia had recorded on her mother's phone one night when she'd been woken by shouting. In the video, David's enraged voice could be clearly heard, along with the sound of something shattering and Emily's frightened pleas. As the video ended, I could see tears in the judge's eyes. David sat slumped in his chair, all pretense of innocence gone. The judge's verdict came swiftly and decisively. David was sentenced to prison for domestic abuse, with mandatory counseling. Emily was granted a divorce, awarded 50% of their shared property, substantial financial compensation, and full custody of Sophia. David was barred from any contact with Sophia until she turned 18, and even then, only if she chose to see him. As the gavel fell, I felt a wave of relief wash over me. Emily collapsed into my arms, sobbing, not from fear this time, but from sheer relief. It's over, mom, she whispered. It's finally over. As we left the courtroom, I saw David being led away in handcuffs. Our eyes met for a brief moment, and I saw something I never expected, regret. But it was too little, too late. As I stood in my kitchen, preparing a feast for our weekly family dinner, I couldn't help but smile. The house was filled with the cheerful noise of my grandchildren playing, the aroma of roasting chicken, and the gentle hum of conversation from the living room where Emily and Michael were catching up. It had been six months since the court hearing, and the change in our family was palpable. The dark cloud that had hung over us for so long had finally lifted, replaced by a warmth and joy that I had feared we might never experience again. Emily and Sophia had moved in with Jack and me after the trial. At first, I worried it might be challenging for all of us to adjust, but those fears quickly dissipated. Having them close allowed us to provide the support and love they needed to heal. Sophia, my brave little granddaughter, was making remarkable progress. 
The nightmares that had plagued her in the early days after leaving David had become less frequent. Now, more often than not, I would hear her giggling with her cousin Tommy as they played elaborate make-believe games. Grandma, look, Sophia called out, running into the kitchen with a drawing in her hand. I made this for you. I wiped my hands on my apron and knelt down to examine her artwork. The page was filled with bright colors, a stark contrast to the dark, scribbled drawings she had produced in the months following the trial. This picture showed our family, stick figures with big smiles, standing in front of a yellow house, with a rainbow arching overhead. It's beautiful, sweetheart, I said, pulling her into a hug. Why don't we hang it on the fridge? As I stood up, I caught sight of Emily watching us from the doorway, a soft smile on her face. The change in her was just as remarkable as Sophia's. The haunted look in her eyes had faded, replaced by a spark of life that grew brighter each day. Need any help, mom? She asked, stepping into the kitchen. You can set the table if you'd like, I replied, gesturing to the stack of plates on the counter. As we worked side by side, I marveled at how natural it felt. These simple moments of domesticity, once taken for granted, now felt like precious gifts. Emily had started drawing again, something she hadn't done since the early days of her marriage to David. Her studio, once Jack's old office, was filled with canvases. I had watched her art evolve over the past months, mirroring her healing journey. The first pieces had been dark and chaotic, all harsh lines and somber colors. But gradually, light began to creep in. Now, her latest works were explosions of color and life. I have some exciting news, Emily said as she laid out the silverware. The gallery downtown wants to feature some of my new pieces in their upcoming show. Oh, sweetheart, that's wonderful. I exclaimed, pulling her into a hug. I'm so proud of you. Emily beamed, her eyes shining with a confidence I hadn't seen in years. She had recently started working part-time at a local art supply store, slowly reintegrating into the workforce. It was a small step, but an important one in reclaiming her independence. As we all gathered around the dinner table that evening, Jack, Michael, Lisa, Tommy, Emily, Sophia, and me, I felt a wave of gratitude wash over me. The road to this moment had been long and painful, but looking at the smiling faces of my family, I knew it had been worth every struggle.